Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode four of the Caught by Happy podcast. Did you know that October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month? I did not know that, but I know it now because my friend Tara Dowdowney came over and we had a long chat about her experience battling breast cancer over this past year and a half or so. Uh, it's an it's a amazing story, and Tara's just a little bit younger than me, and she has children just about the same age as my kids. You're going to hear all about how she broke the news to her kids that she was going to be undergoing chemotherapy and losing her hair and, you know, kind of her feelings about, you know, the uncertainty of it all. What's going to happen to her? How sick is she going to get? Is she going to survive it? And what that's going to mean for her family. Tara's story is not unique. There are a lot of people, a lot of women in particular, and men who have to deal with breast cancer, who have to fight it, who have to get treatment for it. Chances are, you know somebody who is affected by breast cancer in their lives, whether it's themselves or someone they love, or maybe it's someone you love. So it's an important topic, and I'm super happy that Tara agreed to come on and, and talk about her journey. If there's one thing I, w- I would really like you to get, b- get out of this episode, especially if you're a woman, but it really it, it applies to men and women, you are the owner of your body. You're the only owner. You're the only one that knows what it feels like. If something feels wrong to you, it's your responsibility to stand up and say, hey, I need, th- I need to get this checked out. It needs to be a priority. And you're the only one who can make it a priority. So if, if something feels wrong, get to your doctor and say, I, I really would like this checked out now. Don't put it off. Don't be like me and say, eh, you know, I'll figure it out some other time. It hurts, but I'll, I'll get it checked out later. No, if it hurts, if it's, if it's weird, if it doesn't feel right, it's your responsibility to get it checked out right away. And Tara, luckily, is somebody who did that for herself. And as Tara's friend, I can tell you that we are very glad that she did. All right, before we get into it with Tara, just let me say thank you real quick to all of you who have downloaded or subscribed or told your friends about the Caught by Happy podcast. The response has been pretty amazing, and I'm really surprised, honestly. I've had people reach out to me that I haven't talked to in years saying either, you know, nice job with the podcast, or I'd love to be on your podcast, or why are you doing a podcast, (laughs) which is really their way of saying uh, your podcast sucks, maybe. Um, but honestly, the response is far beyond what I expected it to be, especially only three or four episodes in. So thank you so much. So all that said, if you do have a story you'd like to share with me on the show, please do reach out at caughtbyhappy at gmail.com, or you can send me a DM on Instagram or on Facebook. This has been great. It's been great. And I hope I get to do, you know, a hundred more of these. It's, It's something I've really enjoyed doing over the past month. And I'm glad that I, you know, kind of put my self-doubt aside and I stopped worrying about what other people would think because that was really stopping me from starting the thing in the first place. I've wanted to do a podcast for a long time, but I was always afraid of what people would say and or what other people would think. So I'm glad that I'm here at this point now and I'm glad I got to do at least four of these things. All right, that's enough of that. Let's just, no one wants to hear me talk. Let's just, let's talk to Tara. She's the, she's why you're here, right? She's the one with the story. Let's talk to her. Hi, Tara. Hi, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm, I'm really good. I'm a lot better than I was a year ago. <laughs> yeah, I bet you are. <laughs> I'm super happy that you came over. Thank you for having me. You're you're like a legit guest in my house. We're not doing this on Skype nope. or anything. Nope, I'm right. I'm here. <laughs> so yeah, we've got a lot to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> but before we even get into anything, let's just get into like how we know each other. Yeah. So we've known each other for 10, 15 years at this point, yeah. right? Yeah. We we all came from uh, Channel 12. That's right. Yeah. Local TV station. Back what in the year day. did you start working there? I started working there in 2004. Oh, so I was like July. halfway through my yeah. tenure there. Yep. Yeah. And I was hidden away on the weekends and evenings. So I kind of, I don't think we crossed paths all that much because you were mornings, right? Right. Yeah. But we were kind of part of this bigger group of people. Yep. Yeah, I think we probably worked together when I would fill in on the weekends or right. at night. But yeah, yeah. But I do remember. Yeah, I remember working with you. I a do few too. Times. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
if I can remember that. How long were you there? When did you leave? I was only there for about a year and a half. Oh, really? Maybe two years. Yeah, I left. It was about, yeah, it was about two years. No, maybe a year and a half. I don't, I'm, I don't even exactly remember, but I went up to Connecticut um, and I got a job at a TV station up there. So I left pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. I don't remember that. Yeah, I thought you guys, I thought, well, well let's get into it. Like you met yeah, so your husband Ray at Channel 12. At Channel 12, yes. So I remember him from my interview. Actually, I, I was like, oh, that's a cute reporter. <laughs> Did he interview you? No, he was just in the newsroom and uh, I, I spotted him. Um, but we didn't get together until about a year later because we we're both dating other people. And uh-huh. um, and then our friend Teresa yeah. played Cupid. T-Van. T-Van. Yeah. <laughs> Shout she, out T-Van. Yeah. She was my roommate at the time and she was friends with both of us. And she, Did you live in the Orange House? We lived next door to the Orange House in that apartment on the top. Do you um, do you remember we had a Halloween party there? I remember. Th- yes. I was going to ask about the Halloween the parties. The Halloween party. Yes. So Teresa had a bunch of parties at the Orange House, and then we moved to the upstairs apartment at the house right next door. Okay. And um, we had at least one epic Halloween party. At least one? Yeah. <laughs> Those were the days. <laughs> and um, Ray and I were dating at the time, but nobody knew it. We were, uh-huh. you know, keeping it professional at work. And um, yeah, I was going to ask about that because I kind of remember finding out that you guys were dating. Yeah. And I was like, oh, huh? how am I like, when did this happen? Yeah. We kept it quiet for three months or so. Wow. It's got to be professional. Yeah. And uh, I think we were kind of waiting to see what happened before we... <laughs> Before we went public with it, but I mean, as you know, at that time we were all kind of friends with one another, so yeah. personal and professional all kind of blended right. together. Yeah. So we started dating, and then in short order, I got the job in Connecticut and moved to Connecticut. But I was still kind of around because I would come and visit Ray all the time. And okay, so Ray was still me. here. He was still there, yeah, for a good year or so until I could convince him to come up to Connecticut. What were you doing in Connecticut? Were you at a station? I was at a station. I was at WFSB and I was their special projects producer and their investigative and consumer producer up there. Oh, wow. So this is like 2006? 2006, yeah. Wow. I was there from 2006 until 2008. Okay. End of 2008. Well, let's let's go back even before that. Okay. Let's go to where you're from. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Ohio in a very small town about an hour south of Cleveland called Ravenna. And it wasn't even in the town. I was in the township. So we lived kind of in the middle of nowhere. We, I grew up, my dad was a biology teacher. Uh-huh. And, um, at a high school or college? He was at a high school. And then eventually he started working for Chrysler. Um, but his love of feathered friends continued. So I grew up with chickens and turkeys and peacocks. And was that his uh, area of study in biology? I think it was his area of interest. Birds. Birds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Bird guy. We, he was a bird guy. Yeah. <laughs> so we uh, we had a lot of, we had an emu at one point. Oh, really? Yeah, we did. Peacocks were very common at our house. Did you have some land? Um, A couple acres. Yeah. Yeah. I bet it was pretty, it, pretty loud out there with the peacock squeaking. They, in the... It wasn't too bad. <laughs> it wasn't too bad. I remember I had a turkey growing up. Yeah. Mr. Peepers. There you go. Ugh. Turkey protected us kids. Yeah. Anybody, anytime anybody came in the driveway, that turkey would charge mm-hmm. them. <laughs> they only like who they like. Yeah. 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 So we had a couple of turkeys. We had some pheasants back there. We had a bunch of interesting animals. All right. So you're hanging out in yeah. Ravenna, in Ohio. Ravenna, Ohio. Yep. South of Cleveland. Yep. And you got these birds hanging around. Got the birds. Yep. Where'd you go to school? Where'd you go to college? I went to Syracuse University. Oh, you did? I did oh, because wow. I knew that I wanted to be a journalist and they have a good journalism program. Did you go to school with Richard? I I didn't know Richard at the time. Yeah. We we he was a year ahead of me. So our friend um, Richard Washington, Syracuse alum. He never he never let anybody forget it. And and I don't either, usually. <laughs> <laughs> Syracuse alums don't usually. So yeah, yeah, we had a lot of fun talking about that once I met him. Okay. So you're at Syracuse studying yep. some journalism. Yep. Studying broadcast journalism. Uh-huh. And I loved it. It was great. I went to Italy for a semester and did some cool internships. And then after school, I went to Albany, New York 
as a special projects producer. So I worked with a reporter and a photographer. We were a three-person team, and we did investigations and consumer stuff, and it was a really great So your first job out of school was Albany. That's a pretty good size market, right? Yeah, it was. I was like number three on a three-person team, so it was definitely an entry-level job, but I got a lot of really good hands-on experience. Well, hey, you got to start somewhere, right? Yeah, and they were great. The producer and, uh, I'm sorry, the reporter and the photographer that I worked with were really, really great. And I learned a lot from them. How long were you there? I was there about a year and then I came down to Richmond. Oh, so Richmond was like pretty soon after Mm -hmm. college, man. Yeah. About a year later. Yeah. I jumped, I've moved around quite a bit. Um, yeah. Frank Jones gave me a call and I said, I've never produced a TV show before, only segments. And he said, oh, you went to Syracuse, you'll be fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So Richard and I had a good laugh over that story at, at one point. But yeah, so Frank brought me down to Richmond and I knew on that interview, I saw the cute reporter and uh-huh. the rest is history. Right? You, ever talk to, you ever talk to Frank anymore or keep in touch with him? We see him around town a lot. So yeah. Ray, my husband, worked there until a couple years ago. So he he saw Frank every day. So we run into Frank every now and then and we keep up with them a little bit. Yeah. 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 Well, Ray didn't work there the whole time, right? You guys were in New York City for a while. We were. So after Connecticut, we moved to New York City. Yeah. I got a transfer. My company in Hartford opened a production house down in New York City, and they knew that I was interested in working down there, and they were looking for segment producers. So I went down to New York City, and Ray got a job in New York as well. So we moved there and lived right in the city. Yeah, Ray was working at 30 Rock, right? He was. He was working at 30 Rock, and he's got some fun stories about yeah. that. You should talk to him about he that. Was like, he was like the guy on, in the cabs. He yeah, was, he was. <laughs> yeah. The cab videos that they would he, play on the back of the seats. Yep, he programmed that, and he was in some of them, and it would, yeah, people would see him in the cabs. And it was, What year did you guys get married? We got married in 2009, so we celebrated our 10th anniversary this year. Wow, congrats. Thank you, yeah. So we were living in New York at the time. Basically, from the time we got engaged until we were getting ready to have our first baby we lived in new york so mm-hmm. that's pretty like pretty much the perfect time yeah to be in Before a city kids, like that yeah for sure get it out of your system exactly well, did you live in, <laughs> did you oh you want to go back i, I mean not with the kids <laughs> yeah. did you uh did you live in manhattan were you in brooklyn yeah. where did you live we were on the upper west side in manhattan and yeah. it was a nice residential neighborhood but we pretty much had access to everything and we were both of us worked in midtown so it was pretty easy to get to work and you know, it was like thinking about it now, the apartment was the size of my kitchen and old, and, but we didn't care. $7,000 a month. <laughs> Approximately. Yes. Yeah. Man, I don't know how people do it. I mean, we I guess were, they don't have kids. That's we how. were young. We didn't have kids. Yeah. We went out a lot. We didn't spend a lot of time at home, so it didn't matter. And you had good jobs. Yeah, we yeah. did. We were in New York. We were living it up. Yeah, I mean, every time I visit New York, I, th- I think to myself, man, my time has passed. Like yeah. I should, I should have done this. I should have done this when I was twenty-four. We we were lucky that we hit it when we did because we were old enough to have decent jobs, but young enough to not have kids and everything that that came with that. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, how did you get back to Richmond? So I was pregnant, and we were looking around our apartment, and we were like, "This is not going to work with a kid." We also, while we had good jobs, we worked a lot. We spent a lot of time working and that was a big part of our lives. And we knew we wanted to scale back a little bit when we had kids. So we were looking at all kinds of places to work and just the fates aligned. And there was a job back at Channel 12 that Ray was perfect for that combined his on-air experience and his digital experience that he had been doing in New York. And Ray hopped around quite a bit before he got to 12, right? He did, yeah. Once we got to New York, he went from New York right to 12. Right. Um, but before but, his mm-hmm. first stint at 12, he was out in California for a while. Yeah, he was in. So he grew up in California, went from Arizona to Roanoke to Richmond. Yeah. And then, yeah, so he he and I have both moved around quite a bit. And we kind of knew like this was this next move was probably going to be it for a long time for us. We was didn't, Richmond like the factor like, oh, my God, I love Richmond. I want to go back there. Or was yeah. it just, just so happened to be that's no, what the job No, we was? were targeting Richmond. We both really loved our time in Richmond. We had friends in Richmond, of which you were one of them, hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which was a big thing for us. We knew that it was a good place to raise a family. We knew that it was a good cost of living. He was the Richmond reporter when he was at Channel 12, so he really fell in love with the city, and I really liked it there also. So, And, you know, it's the weather's nicer than Mm -hmm. New York and where I grew up, Mm -hmm. not nicer than where he grew up in San Diego, but (laughs) you know, compromise. 
we really thought Richmond would be a great place to raise our family. And, and we were right. We love it here. So you had, um, your daughter, yep. your first daughter. Had our first daughter. Here in Richmond? Here in Richmond, yeah. And I, one of my first memories was we were at a friend's house and you brought your little baby over, little yes. Lucy, when she was just a couple months old. And um, I was very pregnant. And I remember watching a football game with you all. And yeah, and we were here and we bought a house and yeah. a car because we didn't have cars because we lived in New York City. Right. And had a baby and moved all in about four and a half months. Yeah, you know, I think it was... It was New Year's Eve one year, mm-hmm. and Lucy was a little baby. I think that's yep. And Amira, your daughter was not born no. yet. No, and <laughs> we stayed out until the ball drop. Yeah, we, you know, we watched the ball drop at your house. Oh, I remember I think that. It was your house. They were a little bit older then. Oh, were they older? Yeah, I think they were like one or two, and they were like up and kind of. Oh, napping you know what I'm thinking and... of? I'm thinking of a of a the football game at Brandon and Jess's maybe. Yeah. There's a lot of times we all get but there together. Was that yeah. time, there was that t- there's that time when the kids are really young, ba- yeah. like baby infant yeah. babies, when you're like, oh, I could I could take them with me right? and go out and do things. I rem- and I think there was a New Year's at our house where yeah. we all stayed up till midnight and we had kids and we right. were like, what's happening? This yeah. is and they're like one year old. Yeah, and, <laughs> and it didn't matter because they were it, now that would be a disaster. But no. yeah, they were supposed to go to sleep and I don't. The, think but they, they don't did. think they did. I yeah. had a pack and play set up, but no one used it. I think it, that was I the think. last yeah. time I brought any of my kids anywhere <laughs> with me where adults would be around. Yeah. Like you see it, these people now, they go to breweries and their kids are just running around. I can't do it. Nope. Nope. <laughs> go to bed. Nope. Yep. We get a babysitter. It's fine. <laughs> All right. So you're back in Richmond. Mm-hmm. You've got one kid. Yep. I was super pregnant when we moved here. So I didn't really look for a job because I knew I would only work for a couple months and then take maternity. So I was doing some freelance work for my company back in New York. They brought me back on as a freelancer. So I was working remotely and doing that. And I did that for about the first year and a half or two years of Amira's life. Yeah. Um, I worked mainly from home. I went on location a little bit. How was that trying to, you know, have a baby and work at, in your house? I had to hire help. Yeah. Um, I, cause I, I couldn't work. I couldn't attend to both. Right. And I knew that that would be too much. So, but it was part-time, I, you know, she, I would work while she napped and I would have a sitter come over for a couple hours a day. And it was a nice way to do both. To try to have it all, which yeah is not possible, but you know we tried, and then that kind of dried up. The show changed, and they stopped using freelancers. I've kind of had a, I guess you could say, a spotty employment record since uh, <laughs> <laughs> since moving to Richmond. <laughs> but you've been hopping around. Yeah. You've been working. You've been doing always some doing yeah. something. Um, yeah, I was working with my friends at their bridal salon for a while. I was work part-time at channel six for a while Mm -hmm. most that that was pretty recently i've done some work for richmond mom's blog i just had an article published in richmond family magazine so i do a lot of freelance work and part-time work and And you had another baby somewhere i had another baby somewhere in there yep little adrena she came along three and a half years ago it's been a busy eight years seven and a half eight years wow so the last couple of years have been kind of crazy for you yeah a little crazy we also you know along that time went through cancer yeah (laughs) Breast cancer. So that um, was really unexpected. So tell me about how that whole thing came about. When did you first realize something was up? I had no clue anything was going on. I was home. Ray had gone out to hang out with, I think you guys, one Saturday night. It was July 21st of 2018. So not even a year and a half ago. And I was just like in my comfy wear on the couch. And I put on a sports bra I don't normally wear. And it felt weird. And I didn't like how it felt. So I was kind of like feeling like what's going on. And I found a lump. So I'm home basically by myself. The kids are sleeping. So I, you know, consult Dr. Google to see what's going on here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the old WebMD. Yeah. So what else am I doing? I'm Googling this. Find out that this. you died six months ago. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, actually, Dr. Google told me I was okay. Oh, Nothing right. to worry about. But I was like, hmm, I should probably get that checked. But I thought, well, let me just, you know, see if it's still there in the morning. I don't know what I thought was going to happen overnight. But, you know, the next morning it was there. And so I went to my doctor's office on Monday and I said, this is a problem. I should get it checked. And they they kind of felt it and said, oh, yeah, it's probably a cyst. It's probably nothing. But just go have a mammogram. I don't have any history of breast cancer in my family. I don't have any of the risk factors. I tend to eat relatively well. I'm relatively active. I don't, you know, there wasn't anything 
um, any other symptoms that indicated that there might be a problem. But I'm a worried person. So I thought, let's just check this off. Like, you know, even if it's a cyst, I might want to get it removed if it's bothering me. So they said, okay, you can have a mammogram in two weeks because you have to have a special mammogram if they feel something, a diagnostic mammogram it's called. And I was like, yeah, that's not going to work for me. I can't sit here and think about this for for two two weeks. weeks. So I got in my car. They had given me a list of all the places that offer these diagnostic mammograms. And I called called everyone until I got an appointment three days later. Wow. How many did you have to go through? Uh, three or four. But you know, when you, ever, when you talked, when you call to try to schedule an appointment for something, it's, it's not yeah. a quick call. So, so your doctor or the, they were telling you just, yeah, two weeks, we'll get it yeah. taken care of, but you didn't. I, yeah, that wasn't quick enough for me. Yeah. And in hindsight, I'm glad I followed that gut feeling. So I scheduled it for that Thursday. Ray was in Norfolk for work that day and was planning on spending the night there. So I, I, the kids were at daycare whatever. And, um, they were being watched. So I went by myself because we didn't, no one thought it was anything. I had the mammogram, which I was like super annoyed. I'm not even 40. I already have to have a mammogram. Like everyone says these are awful. I go in and I have it and it's whatever. I did it. And they were like, Oh yeah, we saw something. It looks like a cyst. They said, we have to do an ultrasound. If we see something, we followed up with an ultrasound. So I was like, okay, So I go on the ultrasound and the tech is getting quieter and quieter and taking more pictures and more pictures. And, you know, they're, they're not supposed to say anything. Right. But, but you know, something's something's happening. Well, yeah. I mean, any other time I'd had an ultrasound, it's been when I was pregnant. Right. And it's like, yay, look at the baby. The baby's waving, you know, whatever it is. So it's, it's pretty joyous. You know, we're taking pictures, the whole thing. Yeah. This, not so much. So then she... She said, okay, I'm going to go get the doctor and he's going to do it all again. The whole thing? The the whole ultrasound again. Wow. And I'm thinking, well, this isn't good. (laughs) Yeah. But I'm like, oh, it's, it's an ultrasound. You know, what are they, what conclusion can they come to from just an ultrasound? So the doctor comes in, does everything again, says, okay, we don't know for sure, but it's cancer. Just from the ultrasound. Mm -hmm. Looked at it and said... This is definitely not a cyst. Yeah. He, we don't know for sure, but this is cancer. Those were the exact words. Okay. I, I was not expecting to hear those words. I, I just, just lost it. I just started sobbing. And the technician was very kind. And she said, what can I do for you? And I said, get me my phone. Mm-hmm. I called Ray and I said, you have to get in the car right now and come home. Like, I, I need you here tonight. Like, this is not what I was expecting to hear. So he, of course, did. He got in the car. By the time I went, you know, finished up, went and got the kids and got home, he was home like 45 minutes later. And I was just in shock. I I thought the first thing you think of is this is a death sentence. I'm going to die. I have cancer. So keep in mind, they don't know what type of cancer. They don't know where It all has gone. They don't know anything about this except that they think it looks like cancer on an ultrasound. I had to go back in for a biopsy where they take. How um, how, how long? That was a that was a Thursday. They scheduled me the next day for the biopsy because I was having such a reaction (laughs) to this news. So and then the biopsy takes a few days to officially come back because they have to test everything. What was that waiting like? It was awful. The those two weeks were the most awful because even after the biopsy, they say, yes, it's confirmed it's cancer. They still don't know where it's gone. They still, they don't know the scope of it. Right. I was, you know, over that weekend thinking he could be wrong. He could be, it could, it could be not cancer. There's a possibility that he's wrong. (laughs) So then the next Wednesday when we went in, you know, we confirmed it was cancer. That's all they knew at that point. They called it invasive ductal carcinoma, which is a type of breast cancer. I did not know very much about breast cancer at that time. Most people don't. Um, But there are different hormone receptors that it can be positive or negative for, which affects the treatment and the aggressive nature of the cancer. The only thing the doctor told me, we confirmed that it had gone into my lymph nodes because they biopsied a lymph node as well because those looked suspicious to them. She said it looked angry. What does that mean? That's a very good question. Aggressive? So she didn't elaborate. Mm -hmm. Um, So all I knew was I had angry cancer. (laughs) (laughs) 
So I was, I was a little beside myself. What, how did you deal with communicating any of this to your girls? So I waited until I found out the scope of what was going on because. Did they know something was going on? Um, no. And here's why. So that was a Wednesday. That Friday, we had planned to go to see my family in Ohio just for a routine summer visit. Um, I got diagnosed on August 1st. So that weekend, my mom had actually got us Hamilton tickets in Cleveland. So we were going up to see Hamilton and we were going to go for a long weekend. My sister and brother-in-law were in oncology at the Cleveland Clinic. And my other sister was a scheduler at the Cleveland Clinic. So between the three of them, they found recommendations for people who specialized in young women's breast cancer and were able to get me on their schedules that following week. They said, just come up, take some appointments. We'll get you in with the right people. And a long weekend turned into two and a half weeks. We were in Cleveland and I went through about a dozen or so tests Um, scans. I had a medical port put in. I met with a whole team of doctors who were able to tell me the scope of this because the message to your kids is much different. Mommy's going to be very sick and die or mommy's going to have a rough couple months and then be okay. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to wait until we knew what we were dealing with before we told them. So while Ray and I were at all these appointments, they were just having fun with my mom. Right. They were basically at Camp Grammy, just, you know, living it up. So I don't think they really thought about why are mom and dad not here. We didn't really tell them. Once we found out, there were a couple key moments in that two weeks. The one was um, my hematology oncologist who's the director of the breast clinic up in Cleveland he at one point looked me in the eye and he said you're going to be okay it was at that moment that I I believed him I knew he wouldn't be telling me that if he didn't think it was true because the big question before that is am I going to die those few words from him really changed how I was approaching this we figured out that I was going to do chemo and then surgery and then radiation. And we determined that the cancer had not spread outside the breast and the lymph nodes. So those are good. That's a good thing. And this is all within that two weeks that Mm -hmm. you're up in Cleveland. Yes. They, because I was from out of town, they were reading the tests like within hours. And I was, you know, communicating with the doctors by phone and um, with their teams. And I just, I felt very supported. Like they, there was an urgency about the care that they were providing me. And I think that made a big difference. If you weren't already planning to go up to Cleveland yeah. for this, you know, for those couple of weeks anyways, mm-hmm. would, would you have stayed in Richmond for treatment or would you have gone up to Cleveland anyways? Cause your family's there and it's a renowned yeah. cancer center. I think that my family would have really encouraged me to come up. I might not have done it as quickly. I happened to be there, so I was able to get in really quickly. But I think I probably would have consulted with them. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to relocate my family for the duration of the treatment. So we ended up coming back to Richmond, but I'll I'll get to that in a second. Um, We found out the scope. We found out what was going to happen. My breast cancer is triple negative, so it doesn't have any hormone. It didn't test positive for any hormone receptors. Triple negative is a very aggressive type of breast cancer. So I may have only had cancer for a few months before I found it. And had I not found it, it could have grown exponentially. Mm -hmm. So I'm very, very lucky that I caught it when I did, even though I was a stage three. You caught it when you did and you were adamant about getting in and getting scanned as soon as possible. An extra week here, an extra week there could have made a big difference in the success of my treatment. We sat the kids down. We were still with family and everyone was sleeping except the kids and us, which is common when Mm, you have little kids. Right. And so the two-year-old is kind of oblivious, but the six-year-old, you know, we said, oh, you may have noticed, you know, we've been going to a lot of doctor's appointments. And I said, well, you know, I have this tumor and it's a collection of cells that are bad cells. And in order to get rid of it, they're going to give me some really strong medicine and it's going to make my hair fall out because we knew at that point my hair was going to fall out. That was going to happen. And I let her feel the tumor and she, you know, she had some questions about it, but she seemed like, okay, like you know, we, we didn't use scary words. We used words that she could understand that were factual. We didn't promise anything that we didn't know was going to happen. So we, we kept it very basic, but honest. 
Yes. And how did she take it? Okay. You know, moving along with life, my mom comes downstairs for breakfast and she says to my mom, grandma, grandma, mommy's going to get medicine for her boob. That's going to make her hair fall out. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) talk about putting it in the most simple terms you could possibly put it into. Well, my mom didn't know we had told them. So my mom, (laughs) the look on my mom's face was like, yeah. (laughs) So I was, I was glad because I was like, okay, she got it. You know, she understood it. Um, but there, there were some, you know, funny moments. Like she was on a cheerleading team and they did like breast cancer awareness, like stickers on their face or something. They wore pink bows last time. No, just, uh, they just, just did that. And, you know, Amira's like, my mommy has breast cancer. And yeah. everyone on the team <laughs> kind of was like, wait, what? <laughs> wow. When did you start telling friends? So, was, it, was it about that same time? Yeah. I, I, I was really bad at telling people because... I didn't sugarcoat it. Our group of friends was the first people outside family and like my boss that knew. And really it's because... It came from a Facebook message, didn't it? It came from a Facebook message. And so this is... So there's a couple of funny things. Brandon and Jess wanted to borrow our bounce house for their daughter's birthday party. And we had to be like, we're not coming to the birthday party because we're in Cleveland because I'm going to get chemo. And we, our Facebook message, someone had changed all the names to like characters. Because it was from the Festivus, yeah. our mm-hmm. annual Christmas party where yeah. we all so had I, different names. So yes. I believe I was Daria Morgendorfer yeah, or something. Yeah, it was a 90s theme yeah, party. Yeah, it was a 90s yeah. theme party, which... Um, <laughs> So I could never tell who was writing what. So I had to write this message and be like, hey, guys, this is Tara. <laughs> and I have cancer. And um, and it was a really like weird way to tell everyone. But we felt like compelled to tell you, like to fill you guys in. And, and at that point, we knew, you know, it was after we found out the scope of what was going on. And <laughs> then someone went back and changed the names to our real names. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And, um, so I started and then I was planning like a wine weekend with another group of friends and I had to be like, I can't come because I'm scheduled for chemo the day before. And so there, I started telling people then, and then this is another really horrible way that I told a bunch of my friends, we got back to Richmond and, um, my friend was having a birthday party for her son who my daughter is really close with. And it was like a pool party and we're all at the pool and they're like, how have you been? And I'm like, well, I had chemo last Friday. I have cancer. And because I, I had my first chemo before I left Cleveland. So mm-hmm. by the time I got back to Richmond, I had already had one round of chemo. And I was like, I have cancer. And she started crying at her son's birthday party. And I felt so bad oh that I'm like spreading this bad news <laughs> at this happy occasion. But And, and I, st- I never really found an appropriate way to tell people. So what was your reaction when she, when she was crying? I was like, I'm just- so sorry. I shouldn't have told you. I should have waited. And she's like, no, are you okay? And I'm like, and I was pretty confident. Like once I heard from my doctor that I was going to be okay, I was like pretty confident that I was going to get through it. I was never looking for sympathy. I was never looking for pity. It was more of a like, this is what's happening in my yes. life and you should know about it. Yeah. I was going to say you mm-hmm. were very factual yeah. about the whole thing. Like, yeah. This is what I've been doing. This is what I'm going to do. And here's the dates that it's happening. Yeah. And it was, I think it was kind of like, you know, I kicked in my journalism background and like reported it basically, you know, yeah. <laughs> I didn't want people to feel bad or, you know, I, but I did want people to know what was going on. Yeah. I didn't want to hide it. So let's talk a little bit about, the treatment. You said you went through the, the first round up in Cleveland mm-hmm. and then you came down to Richmond and had some more. I had eight rounds of chemo every other week for 16 weeks and they fast tracked the first one. So I had the first one in Cleveland before I left. And then I had two weeks to transfer down here. And my doctor had a connection at Massey that he transferred me over to. So I did the rest of my chemo at Massey. Yeah. And that's another pretty amazing. It's a great hospital. Yeah, Yeah, it really is. They're on the forefront of research and that's how the doctors knew one another because they are both researchers. So they were in the same circle Mm -hmm. and I didn't want to uproot the kids. School was getting ready to start. I didn't, you know, Ray had to get back to his job. So I wanted to keep their lives as normal as possible while I went through this. My mom came down and stayed with us for the majority of my chemo, which was huge, Mm -hmm. huge help. Um, she was able to pick the kids up and take them wherever they needed to go. And so I didn't have to, that was one, one more thing I didn't have to worry about. I was able to get my first chemo within a month of finding the lump. 
and within a, like two and a half weeks of getting diagnosed. So that's very quick yeah. to start chemo. And that's probably not the norm for most people, right? Um, I think it's on the short side. Yeah. yeah, I don't think it is. I think most people take a little bit more time, but I was pretty aggressive. I The first four treatments were um, AC, this very powerful combination of drugs. It, it was, it knocked me out. It was the worst, like worse than the worst flu I've ever had every two weeks. For how long? So I would have the treatments on Thursday or Friday. I would start getting sick like two days later and it would last for a good week. And then I would start getting better. Mm -hmm. And then like right before the next treatment, I would be like 90% better. I never quite got to 100%. I felt worse and worse every time. Yeah. Was it throwing up? Was it? It was nausea. So they they manage your side effects quite a bit with chemo. Um, So I had a lot of like nausea medication and achiness like, like the flu basically Were you able to sleep at all or um was it- i slept a lot and yeah. the medication helped with that as well so i spent a lot of time in bed i worked as much as i could i was working part-time at the time obviously i'd have to like take the days off that i went to chemo because chemo would take all day and i would have to take a, a day or two off when i was really sick but i tried to do most of my my i i could tell when i was going to get really sick so i would plan it so i would do that over the weekend it was a long couple months and that's when my hair fell out pretty quickly and um, that was really hard for me. Yeah. I, I got a wig pretty much right away once I figured out the hair was going to fall out. And I had my hair cut to look like the wig. So when I transitioned to the wig, most people at work didn't even know. I was doing a lot with the guests on our show. So I was forward facing a lot. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want it to be distracting. Like I wanted to just do my job as normally as I possibly could. And I would get worn out a lot faster. And I would, you know, but I'm a... I would get my job done and then go home and take a nap because my mom was there to help with the kids. So I was able to do my job and then rest. Well, I remember you wearing the wig. Yeah. I remember the wig, but at some point you decided to stop wearing it. Yeah. About a year ago, um, last October, I worked for a TV station, Channel 6, and I worked on a lifestyle show and I said, I want to do a story about this. It's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I have a story to share. I have this mission of advocacy that I want to develop and I am a bald lady going through cancer. So let's do this. So I invited Katie Sawyer from the Virginia Breast Cancer Foundation. She's the executive director to come on with me. So I had an expert and I took off my wig, which is the first time my coworkers had seen me bald. I was completely bald at that point. On the air? um, No, before we went on, but I I went on live TV with my bald head Uh I had a lot of people in the office come down afterwards and be like, I saw you bald on TV and I didn't know what was going on. I had no idea. And, wow. and, I, and that was purposeful. I didn't want people to treat me differently or to treat me like a cancer patient. Mm-hmm. I wanted them to treat me like a normal person. Right. And they did because they didn't know. <laughs> so we went on and we did this segment. It went well. I posted it on Facebook. So the people that I didn't talk to every day or that I wasn't really close with, found out. And I had three or four people email me, private message me, comment, whatever, saying I wasn't going to get my mammogram or I wasn't looking forward to my mammogram, but I just scheduled it or something along those lines. Like I was going to put this off, but now I'm not. And that was really encouraging for me. And it made me believe that doing that segment was a good thing. Yeah. After the chemo, the last four chemo uh treatments weren't nearly as bad still bad but not nearly as bad i was because the concoction wasn't it was yeah it was a different drug it was called taxol and there are different side effects but i didn't get as many of them so that was good and i had an ultrasound midway through and i knew it was working it was good so chemo ends i had my last chemo treatment the day before thanksgiving i had a no mo chemo party at my house (laughs) that night we toasted and I thanked everyone and it was just a really good opportunity to be grateful because I was feeling so much gratitude because I felt so supported and surrounded. Yeah. Yeah. And it was Thanksgiving. And it was Thanksgiving. It just fit really nicely. I couldn't have written it any better right. than it was. And I knew that the chemo was working. I didn't know how well it was working, but I knew it was working. And I was glad to be done with it. I was grateful to be done with it. So we did that. I enjoyed the holiday season. Week before Christmas, I had um, surgery up in Cleveland. How long was that recovery? Um, after they removed breast tissue and lymph nodes and 
you have drains. So the drains stay in for two to three weeks. And then I couldn't lift anything for six weeks, which included my daughter. Right. That's tough. Yeah. So we had to change her from a crib to a toddler bed and she was two and a half at the time. So she was okay with it and she could climb into my lap, but I couldn't pick her up. So that was really hard. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't enjoy that part of it, but yeah. So about six to eight weeks later, I was ready to go. I had picked up a class at VCU that I was adjuncting. So I started doing that and I was a little, little immobile in my arms still, but I was showing up and doing it and still working at channel six at the time. And just after the new year, we got the pathology back because they test everything that they remove and there was no cancer left. No I, had cancer. A, I had a complete response to the chemo. So that's, ama- that's amazing. It's, it's amazing. It doesn't happen a whole lot, especially because they had to remove 34 of my lymph nodes and none of them had any cancer in them. Wow. The chemo worked incredibly well. We were very lucky about that. And really, you know, that puts my mind at ease, but it also means that there is a lower risk of recurrence. There's always a risk, but that lessens the risk. Beginning of February, I did radiation, even though the cancer was gone because of the initial stage and progression, they still recommended radiation in case there were any little cells floating around. We wanted to get rid of everything. Um, I did 25 radiation sessions where I went every day, weekdays for 25 days and received radiation. And that was really emotionally one of the most difficult parts for me. I just wanted to be done at that point. And yeah, I was very, very glad once that was done, my active treatment was over. How did you feel when you were having the radiation? Did that give you any kind of side effect or? Uh, So radiation, it made me really tired. Radiation is kind of like, imagine sitting out in the sun for like eight to 10 hours a day for like 25 days straight. Like it just, it makes you tired. And just like mentally, I was very worn down because you have to lay in the exact same spot, the exact same way. And I had to do this thing where I was like breathing through this like snorkel thing. Oh, really? Yeah. It was really intense. And like all these machines are moving around you and it. See, I didn't know that. I thought Mm -hmm. it was like a pill that you took. It was like a radiation. There are radiation pills. Mine was actually like I had to go into the hospital every day and lay on this machine and get the beams of radiation. Yeah. So it was very like medical in a way that chemo wasn't because you just sit in a private room and watch TV Mm -hmm. and surgery. I was, I didn't even see in the hospital for 24 hours. I was in and out and then I got to go home and and recover. Yeah. So then, you know, you go from seeing all these doctors and talking to all these doctors to, okay, you're cancer free. Have a good life. (laughs) Okay. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Bye now. (laughs) And I was like, wait, 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 wait. Like what? What my big concern at that point is, what are the odds that I'm going to have to go through this again? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to do this ever again. And my radiation oncologist, who's wonderful, he said, every person's different. The percentages are different. And we don't know what percent you're going to be in. No, no. And if we did, I wouldn't tell you because you can either live every day worrying about what might or might not happen, or you can live every day and enjoy your life. I said, okay. I'm, I'm going to try to do that. And, and most days I do. It's, you know, there are times, of course, I think every cancer patient goes through this where you're like, am I doing it? Am I doing this right? Am I so doing the, enough? So you're cancer free, but I'm, there's mm-hmm. a possibility it could come back just like yeah. there's a possibility that it could hit anyone could else, hit anyone else yeah. for the first time. Yeah. And I have optimized for reducing my rate of recurrence, which is is something that I decided from the beginning and, you know, also trying to make lifestyle changes, be a little more active, eat a few more vegetables, eat a little less sugar and stuff like that. There are things that can help, but we don't know enough to know what triggered it in the first place. So we don't know what could bring it back. Right. You talked about being on TV and showing off your bald head for the first time, but you've, I've seen you on TV quite a bit since yeah. then, and not just on TV, but in magazines and some local publication. How'd you get involved in speaking out and doing the advocacy? So I think that it's a combination of things. Like when I found out I was going to be okay, I thought, okay, I need to pay this forward somehow. I'm really lucky in a lot of ways. I have great medical care. I have great support. I have a voice that I use. And I live in a place with lots of resources. That's not true for everyone. So I really felt compelled to encourage other people to follow what their body is telling them. I've always thought I've had a good sense of of my body and when something's wrong. And I 
really want other people to think about that and make it a priority. Women and men, like my husband has said, if that was me, I would have said, I'll get it checked whenever I get it checked. Right. Uh, Same here. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, women and and my peers, young moms tend to put their health on the back burner in lieu of everything else that's going on in their lives. Sure. We're all at a very busy time in our lives. Kids got to get ready for school. They got to get dinner on the table. Right. They got to go oh, to sports practice. Right. I can't go to the doctor because I'm taking you to gymnastics and then I'm doing this and cooking dinner and whatever. I think like for me to sit here and say, look, there was no reason for me to have breast cancer. Absolutely none. But thank goodness I got it checked. And, you know, if I would have gotten it checked and it would have been nothing, thank goodness for that too. So it really became important to me to, to be able to tell other people that. And I was very lucky because of the job that I had, that I was given a platform to do that. Reba Hollingsworth saw the segment I did on Virginia this morning. And then she asked me to do a buddy check six. She does a segment on the sixth of every month on channel six that encourages women to check themselves and check on their friends, not literally, but like ask them. (laughs) Uh, So there was another um, wonderful lady at channel six named Yvonne Lebron that went through breast cancer. So she did the story around both of us and we met and it was really lovely. Yvonne worked evenings and I worked mornings. So we hadn't previously met. So we did that and I got plugged in with Virginia Breast Cancer Foundation and started doing some work with them. They are a statewide organization. It's a nonprofit that does education and advocacy. So I was able to go up to the General Assembly and talk to my state representatives about issues that affect cancer patients in our state. And it was, it felt really good to try to affect change at that level you know I've been real busy this month it's October it's breast cancer awareness month I um perfect yeah perfect time right for me to post this <laughs> I um <laughs> pitched and wrote a story for Richmond Family Magazine that was about talking to your kids about difficult topics because I didn't make a whole lot of time to research that when I was getting diagnosed with cancer and that was a mistake that I made we ended up handling it pretty well but I think had I had I researched it a little more I would have felt a little more confident about that and we maybe could have avoided you know, any, any, str- you don't, you don't, the first thing you think about is you don't want to stress your kids out. You don't want to affect their lives with your thing, you know? So that was a big priority for me. And I wanted to get that information out to other parents as well. So I'm continuing to, um, to speak and to, uh, you know, do volunteer work. I'm on a committee where we're putting together a luncheon that benefits cancer research because there's, couple different parts in my mind. There's the advocacy part, the education part, and then there's the cancer research part of it. I, you know, it's pretty amazing how the cancer changed the trajectory of yeah. your life, not just your, yeah. you know, having the cancer and going through the treatment right. and the medical stuff, but actually like what you are doing now. Uh, yeah, it it is. And I would still uh, trade the cancer in and, and sure. not have cancer. <laughs> but I feel in a lot of ways, like this is meaningful work that I'm doing and kind of where my life has led me because it's odd how all these kind of components that I've been doing throughout my life have come together for mm-hmm. this. Well, I mean, it's, it's purposeful work, yeah. you know, it's, and it can only be done by someone like you. Right. I'm uniquely qualified yes. in a very unfortunate way. Right. <laughs> And so are many others. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, too many others. Uh, mm-hmm. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm super happy you're well now. Yes. Let's, let's hope it stays that way. <laughs> so what, I, what, are, what are you doing now, you know, apart from the advocacy and the cancer treatment? Right. What's, what's next? What's coming up? So I have another surgery coming up. But after my active treatment, it was close to summertime. I decided to kind of slow down a little bit and stay home with my kids for the summer and just do some freelance work. I was freelancing with Richmond Mom's Blog and now Richmond Family Magazine and some other little things here and there. Um, so I'm getting ready for another surgery, um, it's preventative and reconstructive. It's, I'm not as worried about it, but I'm still worried about it because it's a surgery. Yeah. Is that going to be here or up in Cleveland? It'll be up in Cleveland. It'll be over Christmas time again. So my kids can stay up there and have care while I'm recovering. And yeah, then after that, I'll probably start to think about a more steady employment, Mm -hmm. if you will. Um, but I'm really enjoying the volunteer work that I'm doing with the different cancer organizations. So I'd like to do more of that. And I, I also really like the legislative work. So I'll probably doing some lobbying or yeah, if I can that I did last year a little bit. So 
we'll see what, what else I can do. Yeah. We'll go up there and knock on some doors and make them listen <laughs> to me. <laughs> well, you'd be perfect at oh, it. Oh, thank you. You know, I really just want people to, if they take anything from this, just to think about making sure their health is a priority because it's so fleeting. It's a good message, not just for uh, women and for breast cancer and for cancer, but just, to, you know, overall health in general. Right. Really anything. Yeah. Men and women. Men and women. And men can get breast cancer also. Sure. Men can get breast cancer. And, but there's also a host of other ailments that one can be bothered by and ignore that, you know, it's just really knowing your body, knowing what's normal for you. And if something is not normal for you, making it a priority to get that checked. Well said. Thank you. Are there any um, organizations or that you'd like to plug that people can go learn more? Yeah. So Virginia Breast Cancer Foundation is a really great um, organization that offers free educational materials to any group or organization. And they have breast health brochures and they have, if you're newly diagnosed, a survivor or have metastatic cancer, they have free resource guides that they'll send to you. So you can go to vbcf.org and sign up for all of that, Virginia Breast Cancer Foundation. And that's really an organization that I've worked a lot with. And You know, you vote with your dollars in a lot of ways. So there's two things you can do. If you are the type that you like to donate, you can donate to cancer research, cancer education, or you can call your state and federal representatives and urge them to back legislation that helps patients. And that is a nonpartisan thing. So that is people on both sides of the aisle. If you think about it from a patient's perspective and think about, you know, if someone in your life was sick, if you were sick, What kind of laws would you like to see? For the most part, a lot of people do know somebody who is sick or will be sick or has been sick. More often than not. Yeah. 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 So thanks for having me on today. Thank you so much for coming. This is great. And, you know, I got to learn a lot about your story that I didn't really know. Right. Because we've kind of always just like shared it in these very factual (laughs) but humorous ways. through. Facebook group messages or like (laughs) at parties or when we get together at birthday parties for our kids. I promise if this happens again, I won't let you know by Facebook message. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, it's it's just a sign of the time. It is. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thanks, Tara. Thank you. Well, there it is. That was pretty good, don't you think? I think we did all right. I think we had a great chat. It was really good to hear from her in kind of a serious way. Because like I said at the end of that interview, we had talked about it before amongst our friends, but it's it was always so lighthearted that, you know, I really didn't get the full impact of what she was going through, her and Ray and her family, until until now, really. And, you know, keep that in mind. If you know somebody that's that has breast cancer or has gone through breast cancer, you know, it's it's tough. It's a long road with treatment and with chemo and with radiation and with surgeries. I'm really glad that she came on and I hope you take her message to heart and be in touch with your own body and whatever's going on. And don't be afraid to get to your doctor and say, I need a scan. I need you to check this out. Something's up. So like Tara said, vbcf.org that's the organization Virginia Breast Cancer Foundation that she wants you to visit she also wants you to vote with your your dollars as she said donate to cancer research donate to find a cure do whatever you can I think it's I think it's a worthwhile cause for all of us thanks everybody Uh, we'll see you next time remember if you have a story you'd like to pitch email me at caughtbyhappy at gmail.com or DM me on any of my social profiles caughtbyhappy And uh, I guess we'll see you next time. All right, everybody. Bye-bye. This podcast is a production of Harrington Communication Consultants. If you're looking for anything in the way of strategic communications or content marketing or public relations, hit us up on the web, harringtoncc.net, and we'll get you straight.